Good morning. Good morning, people. Welcome to the UK Using Docker track. Thank you for joining us. Um, so my name's Elton. I'm the MC for today. All the sessions in this track are fantastic. So like, just stay where you are for the whole day, and you'll have a great experience. Starting now with Adrian, uh, Adrian's session tips and tricks of the Docker captains. So the Docker captains program is uh, like a community recognition thing. So if you're an expert in Docker and you're going out in the community and talking about it and blogging about it and tweeting about it, then Docker recognizes you by giving, making you a captain. It's a small program. Like These are the, 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 the best Docker experts in the world. Um, we're really lucky here because Adrian is one. Scott is also one. I used to be one. And um, Adrian's talk now is, is uh, tricks that he's amassed from all working with the other Docker captains. So this is a, a series of really useful tips for anyone from beginners to, to really advanced. So here's Adrian, who is Chief Scientist at Container Solutions, which is the best title you'll hear today. Um, big hand for Adrian. This is a fantastic talk. You're going to love it. Yeah, thanks, Elton. Um, by the way, for people coming in or at the back, there's still plenty of seats sort of down the front, in the middle, and the left up here. So there's no need to stand if you don't want to. Um, oh, and my clicker doesn't work. No, never mind. Oh. <laughs> there we go. Um, so this talk is basically about tooling. And how if we take the time to sort of um, get to know our tools and how they work, and we can get the most out of them, we're not just more efficient and more productive in our day-to-day -day work, um, but we're also happier. Because you know, we're not fighting against the technology. Um, we're, we're, making, we're working with it, and we're making it work for us. Um, yeah, so basically, this, this presentation is just a, a collection of various tips and tricks that I've collated primarily from the Docker Captain's program that Elton just explained, um, but also from various people on the internet um, and my own work. Hmm. My clicker doesn't seem happy. Whoa, this has crashed again. Oh, it's Wi Fi. OK, so I split these. Um, uh, tips and tricks up into various sections. Uh, the first one, sort of daily development. So here's some like uh, pretty small tips that can help you sort of day to day when working with Docker. The first one is like um, the Docker PS output. So I don't know about you, but it really annoys me when you type Docker PS or Docker Container LS, um, and the, you know the output scrolls off the end, and it's all kind of messy, and you can't really see what's going on. Um, it actually turns out you can fix that um, because there's a dash dash format argument. And if you pass the dash dash format argument, um, you can specify uh, exactly which um, fields you want in the output. So in this example, I specified that I want a table output, so that's what the headings. Um, and I want the names field, the image field, and the status field. Uh, and now it all fits uh, nicely on like an 80 characters wide uh, terminal. And by the way, I will, I will make these slides available uh, later so you can grab all the, the, the grab all the tips, and also there's a bunch of resources at the end for further reading. Um, uh, if you go to that Docker reference, you will find like, all the different fields you can put in here. Um, I do accept that you know, you're not going to want to type dash dash format every time you run this. I suppose you could set up like a, a bash alias or something, but you can actually also add it, um, configure your default in the docker config.json file. So whenever you install Docker, uh, Docker will set up this docker slash config.json file with your settings. Um, and if you add this PS format argument to it, um, you can define the default output for um, PS format. And this is actually my one. Uh, and this fits in a 80 characters wide terminal. Um, do be careful with this file, though, um, because it does contain like, your passwords for the Docker Hub and stuff. Uh, and it's not encrypted. So don't send your config.json file to anyone. Um, there is a couple of Kubernetes tips in here, which is uh, kind of nice to see, I think. Um, so if you just started on your path with Kubernetes, uh, the first thing you're going to do is use kubectl. Uh, and the very first thing you're going to realize is there's a bit of an argument about how to pronounce it. Um, some people say kubectl is all kubectl and kubectl. Um, I'm on stage, and I have a microphone, so it's kubectl. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, and the first thing you probably want to do is set up uh, a completion for your bash shell or your Z shell or whatever. 
Um, and you type kubectl completion dash dash help. That'll give you full instructions on how to do it for a bunch of different platforms. Um, but basically, it's going to be something like uh, sourcing the output of kubectl completion bash. There's also Z shell. And then from that point on, you'll be able to do things like hit the tab key to, to complete the commands. Uh, so in this example, if you do kubectlg, hit tab, it'll complete to get. Then de, hit tab, it'll complete to deployments. Um, and this is actually a really good way of figuring out what commands are available in Kubernetes. So if you hit kubectl and just hit tab twice, it'll give you all the various commands you can use. And just going through those various commands and you passing dash dash help to see what they do is actually a really good way to sort of get a feel for how kubectl uh, and Kubernetes works. OK, file mounting gotcha. This one like uh, bit me last year. Um, if you mount a single file as a volume and edit it, it might not actually work the way you expect. So in this example, I've got an index.html that just says Moby rules. Um, I'm mounting it in an Nginx container, um, and then I'm curling it, and we get back you know, Moby rules as we expect. But if we then edit the file um, with via or Emacs or whatever on the host, not in the container, so I've edited the file that's mounted in the volume on the host, uh, and I've changed it to say Gordon the turtle rules, and then I curl it again. But a bit strange, the Nginx hasn't updated. It's still got the old uh, text there. Does anybody know why that is? You can shout out. Sorry? No one? Yeah, I thought it was cache at first. It's not the cache at all. It's actually because um, when you mount a volume in Docker, uh, you mount it at the inode level, which is like you know the sort of file system pointers that underlie it. And if you edit a file with a text editor like Vi or Emacs, um, what that actually does is it saves out to a new inode. I think so that um, you know if it crashes, it doesn't corrupt the file. Um, and for that reason, you know the container never sees the new version of the file. Uh, so. If you hit this problem, the, the solution 99.999% of the time is to mount the parent directory. So if you're going to be editing files in a volume, mount a directory, not the file directly. Um, you can also do things like copy the file or use redirection to overwrite the file without changing the inode. But most of the time, mount the parent directory. <laughs> oh, jeez. This is gone again. Um, cleaning up. So you've probably seen like dangling images or those none images when you type Docker images or Docker image ls, and it lists all these images, um, and some of them have none as their tag. Uh, and what's happened is you've been doing like Docker build or something, um, and the old versions of images have become untagged, and they're now these sort of dangling none images. Um, and these images still lie about, and they take up a lot of disk space, uh, and they're probably useless to you. So to tidy that up, if you type Docker image prune, uh, that will delete all the dangling images. Um, and because I'm lazy, it turned out I hadn't run that for a while, uh, and I managed to save 3.67 gigabytes. So it's definitely worth doing now and again. Um, similarly, you can delete the stop container. So when you type Docker ps a, uh, you'll probably see a whole bunch of, of stop containers. Uh, if you're like me and you don't use a dash dash rm argument. Um, to get rid of those, uh, just uh, type docker container prune. And that will remove all stop containers. Uh, again, that will uh, save you some space. Um, you can do more. So you can do docker volume prune, which will remove all volumes that aren't in use by at least one container. Uh, and that will save, can quite often save quite a lot of space as well. And there's Docker networks. So in Docker, you can define like logical networks um, that you can put containers in and stuff. So it's not at the, uh, you know, it's not at the, the networking uh, level of the bridge and so on. It's, it's logical networks within uh, Docker. Um, and if you use Docker Compose, that quite often sets up uh, networks for the, the containers in the, in the Compose file. So sometimes you end up with like uh, networks that aren't actually being used, and Network Prune will remove those. Um, and unsurprisingly, you can do Docker system prune, which will do all the previous ones. So remove stop containers, volumes, networks, and dangling images. 
Um, the next session, uh, next section is basically on building images. Um, a lot of these tips, if you were at um, Abby Fuller's session yesterday on creating effective Docker images, I think she covers a lot of this stuff as well, and also she goes into more depth on various things. So if you're interested in this bit, totally go and check out her talk as well. Um, the first thing that can be confusing is this, uh, is the dot in Docker build, which is the build context. In a lot of tutorials, you just see you know, the instructions run Docker build, and then there's this mysterious dot at the end that's never fully explained. Um, what that is is the build context. Um, and the build context contains all the files or whatever you want to, uh, that you may want to insert into the, into the container or the image, rather. Uh, and the build context actually gets tarballed up by a Docker client and sent to the Docker daemon. So remember, Docker has a, a sort of client um, server model, and even if you're running like on a, you know, your local laptop, there's still, um, that directory is still tarballed up and sent over the network internally to the Docker daemon. So that become, can become an issue and sort of slow you down if you accidentally run a build from uh, your home directory or your downloads directory, for instance. So don't do that. Um, also, if you have a project like a Go project or a C project or whatever, um, quite often there'll be a, a directory with like build artifacts. Um, and those directories tend to be quite large and they won't be used um, in the final image. So what you can do is add those to the docker ignore file and that will stop them being uh, sent to docker daemon and make your builds a little bit faster. Um, on a similar note, don't bust the build cache. So in a lot of programming languages, you, you install dependencies. So the example here is with Node.js, uh, uh, installing NPM dependencies. But uh, the same thing goes for like Python uh, and Java and Maven, et cetera. Uh, in this example, in the first example, we copy over all the source code and then we run npm install. Uh, and this npm install command is quite a, a costly command because it goes off to the internet and downloads all the dependencies so it can take a little while. Um, and the issue is, on the one on the left, if I change any file in the source code, this npm install, that will bust the build cache and the npm install command will run again even though my dependencies probably haven't changed. So what you want to do is first copy over the package.json, then run npm install, then copy over the rest of the source code. And that way, you're only going to bust the build cache if you change the package.json file. Oh, yeah, and the same thing goes for Python and pip, et cetera. Um, minimal images. Uh, so it really is good to like, try and make your images as small as possible. Um, there's two main reasons. One, it's good for security. Um, the less stuff that's in your um, image, the less stuff an attacker uh, has to, to play with uh, and find vulnerabilities in. Um, it's also good uh, for distribution. Uh, you know, smaller images are, the easier it is to send them about, to give them to people, etc. cetera, the less you pay in network costs. Um, there's kind of two main minimal sort of base images. Uh, there's Alpine, which is great. It's only about five megabytes. Um, but it does have a couple of drawbacks. It uses Muzzle instead of glibc which is a much smaller version of the sort of C fundamental library. Um, and the issue is some software isn't compatible with Muzzle because um, it's been compiled against glibc. And also, I have heard of some people having performance problems with Muzzle, so do be aware of that. Um, also, Alpine uses APK as a package manager, so you may find that some software isn't available inside APK. So if you do want to use Debian because of glibc or the better package manager, um, have a look at the Debian Slim image. So if you go to the Docker Hub, you'll see there's a Slim variant of Debian, and that one's only about 55 megabytes. I think the main one's like 100 or so. So that can really help keep the image size down. You can take it even further, though, um, and you can, like, um, you can create like a static binary for your application, say so using Go or Rust or C or something. You can take that static binary, which has all the library, which has all the dependencies baked in, and just copy that into an empty image. So in Docker, we have the scratch image, which is a completely empty sort of base image. Um, and in this example, I've used a multi-stage build. Uh, first off, I'm building my application uh, in Rust with cargo build. And if you use the muzzle target, that actually builds a static binary. Uh, and then in the second stage, I'm creating my release image based on the, the, the empty scratch uh, base image. And I'm copying over the binary from uh, the previous uh, build image. Uh, I'm setting a user, uh, and then I'm setting the CMD to run the, the binary 
Note in the CMD line I had to use the square braces. Um, there's no shell um, in this image. So if I didn't use the, the sort of square braces, I wouldn't actually be able to run the thing. So I tried to run it through the shell, which doesn't exist, and you'll get an error. Um, yeah, and so, and so that's really nice, but um, the issue with it, this approach is that you'll end up with an image of some production that is more difficult to debug because you won't even have a shell and another tool, so do be aware of that. Latest. Um, yeah, I, I think latest is a bit of an unfortunate name for the tag. So latest is sort of a tag that gets um, applied by default to images if you don't give them a, a, a tag. Um, and when you start a night with Docker, because of the name latest, we quite often think that it means something, like it's the latest version of the software. But in fact, it doesn't really mean anything. It's just a tag that gets used if you don't specify a tag. It's not even guaranteed to exist or anything. By convention, but purely by convention, uh, especially with the official images, it generally points to sort of the latest stable version. But that is just a convention. Um, it gets used when you don't specify any tag. So Docker push pull build of my image is exactly the same as saying Docker push pull build of my image colon latest. And that's how it works. And that's all there is to it. Um, going on from tags, try and make sure, especially when your images that get run in production, that you give them a meaningful tag. So you may want to use like semantic versioning, uh, which is where you have like the major version, minor version, and the patch version. Um, or you can also use the git hash to identify the version of the source code your image is built from. Um, but the whole point of doing something like this is to make it obvious uh, when you do like Docker PS or kubectl git pods, and to make it obvious what version of your code is running in production. Um, and you can also use uh, labels to add even more metadata to your images. So if you use like semantic versioning for um, your image tag, you could add a label with the git hash, for example, to make it easy to go back to the source code that your image was created from. Um, and there's actually a whole bunch of sort of uh, standard metadata that we can use that was defined in the OCI image spec. Um, they call it annotations. Uh, and they're sort of the default um, names like org, open containers, image created. That's meant to specify the, the date the image was created on and so on. Uh, and Gareth Rushgrove, who was a uh, who is now actually a, a Docker employee, uh, wrote a nice blog, uh, well, a nice presentation on this, uh, and talking about why it's important to have standard metadata around images. Container lifecycle. Um, so here I've got some tips on like uh, the whole lifecycle images from like uh, starting them up uh, and killing them off at the end. Um, the first one is start up dependably. So quite often, our containers depend on another container. Um, so typically, your application may depend on a database, for example. Um, and sometimes you'll find like, um, the way applications work is they come up, they try to connect to the database, the database isn't there, and they just crash. But please don't do that. It's not a good way to do it. What you should do is that start up, look for the database or any other container dependencies. And if it's not there, just wait and back off until it comes up. Um, yeah, and typically you'll do this in a sort of back-off manner, so you'll check for the database every second. If it's not there, then every five seconds and every 10 seconds, just so you don't overwhelm uh, the dependencies and the old crash when they do come up. Um, if you can, do this sort of thing in the actual application code, so like in your Go source code or whatever. Um, in some cases, you won't be able to do that, especially if you're using like a third-party um, tool. But then, even then, you can still like write a script that starts up that, that you know, and the script will start, it will look for the dependencies, uh, wait for the dependencies to come up, um, and then start the main application. Uh, and Kelsey Hightower, who I'm sure, like most of you, have probably heard of Kelsey, he wrote uh, a really nice blog post called 12 Fractured Apps on this. And yeah, he does a lot of, uh, a lot of um, great stuff with uh, talks and blogs and containers. At the other end of the scale, you need to make sure that your containers shut down gracefully. Um, so what Docker does when it stops a container is it will send the container a sig term signal. It will then wait 10 seconds for that container to, to sort of stop itself. And if it doesn't, it will hard kill a container with a sig kill. And you really don't want the sig kill thing to happen. Um, you really need your containers to get tidied up with a sig term. 
Um, and that gives your application a chance to sort of tidy up after itself, to close any network connections, write any last data out to file, um, and output to log that is shutting down. Um, also, it will mean your container shuts down a lot faster because you're not waiting this 10 seconds for the container to be hard killed. Um, and Srinivas uh, wrote quite a nice blog in this called Docker Features for Handling Container Death. And it's a really long post and goes into a lot of details about this. But to do this, you need to make sure that your application receives signals properly. Um, and in Docker, that generally means making sure your application, if you've got a single process in your, in your container, runs as PID1. So if you have a startup script that starts your application, make sure you start the actual application with exec so it reuses PID1 and doesn't get a different PID. Um, if you do have multiple processes, or, or you, um, you can like forward signals to your main application. Um, there's a tool called Tinny that you can use for that. Um, but I think that's also baked into Docker now. And if you pass a dash dash init flag, uh, you actually sort of get that for free. Um, if you use NPM or Node, um, NPM doesn't seem to handle signals properly for some reason. I think that's still the case. I don't know if it's been fixed yet. Um, so you may actually want to start your Node.js apps with Node, which will properly handle signals. Uh, and Brett Fisher, who's another Docker captain, wrote a nice blog on no Node and Docker good defaults that uh, I suggest you look at if you're using Node. Health checks. Um, so both health checks and proper handling of signals are kind of essential uh, if you want to proper zero downtime updates. If you don't do this sort of thing, what you'll find is that you can have traffic being sent to a container um, when it's not ready to serve that traffic. Um, so health checks are basically just inbuilt monitoring of containers, um, both in Kubernetes and Docker Swarm. Um, they give you sort of fast feedback on any problems uh, and can also automatically fix problems in some cases. However, rather confusingly, um, health checks are different in Kubernetes and Swarm mode. Um, so in Swarm, you actually define the health check in the Docker file. So I've got an example here. here and um, what we're saying here is every 10 seconds, um, run this CMD command in the container. Um, and that will check that the health. Um, in this case, we're using curl. And we're just hitting the local host. Um, basically, if that returns, uh, if that works, then it returns zero and the health check passes. Otherwise, it returns one and the health check fails. Uh, and if you fail, I think, three health checks in a row, you're actually going to, that, that container will be killed and restarted. Um, the first thing to note here is a bit confusing, but this curl command is running inside the container. So you need to have curl installed in the container for this to work. I mean, you can use any command you like at all, but if you use curl, make sure you install it. Um, and curl's a good start, and it's pretty handy if you've got a web application, which is pretty typical. But it does mean you've kind of got an extra dependency that you add into your container, and it's a bit limited in what you can do. Um, so you may want to write a, a sort of bespoke piece of code uh, as part of your application to handle a health check, and then you can do more complicated things. Um, and Elton, um, who's a... <laughs> who's our track host, um, actually wrote a really nice blog on this called Docker Health Checks. So go and check that out if you're interested. Um, interestingly, though, it's a bit different in Kubernetes. And as with a lot of things, it's a bit more complicated in Kubernetes. Um, and Kubernetes actually splits things into liveness probes and readiness probes. And so readiness basically says, is the container ready to serve traffic? Um, and if you fail a readiness probe, um, the container doesn't get killed, but what happens is Kubernetes will stop sending it traffic. Um, the typical use case for readiness is uh, containers that are slow to start up. So say you've got like a, you need to wait for the JVM or something to come up. You can fail the readiness check until everything's ready to, to, to serve your application. Um, there's also a liveness check, which is much more like the Docker health check. And if you fail several liveness checks, the container gets killed uh, and restarted. Um, interestingly, I am intentionally saying container, not pod here. So for health checks in Kubernetes actually work at the container level, not the pod level. Um, yeah, and they're not defined in the Docker file. They're defined in your Kubernetes YAML. Uh, and so I've got an example here um, of a liveness probe. Um, 
In this case, we use an HTTP GET mechanism. Um, so this will actually do like an HTTP call to the health Z um, endpoint. And if that returns to 200, the health check will pass. Um, there's also TCP probes and the exec format. The exec format is basically the same as the, um, the Docker uh, CMD style. Um, if you want to do a readiness probe, it's basically exactly the same as if you see readiness probe, not liveness probe. It just crashed again. Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> Uh, okay. Oh, there we go. And so a couple of tips on security. Um, Read-only file systems. So a really easy way to improve security uh, is to think of make things as immutable as possible. Um, and you can like go further and look at Linux getting things. But um, if you run your containers with dash dash read-only, what will happen is it'll come up with a read-only file system. Um, and the reason that's good is it means attackers can't like modify any files uh, in your container, so they can't like redesign your front page. Um, they also can't write out any sort of trojans or scripts, etc., to the file system because they'll just get like a, a read-only file system error. Um, now the thing is, most applications generally do want to write to files. Um, like so, in this example, I've got Nginx, which wants to, to write to a cache file and also to a PID file. Um, for those files that you do need to write to, you can sort of poke holes in the read-only file system using volumes. Uh, in this case, I've used tempfs, um, which sets up a tempfs volume at the um, given directory. The reason I've used tempfs is that it'll get cleaned up automatically afterwards, so I don't have to worry about deleting the volumes. Uh, don't run as root. So I see this quite a lot. People run uh, containers as the root user in production, um, and that's kind of a bad thing. Um, for a couple of reasons. Uh, the first one being that just if an attacker gets into the container, uh, they're going to have too many privileges within the container itself. You know, the root, they can do whatever they like in the container. But the other one is to do a user namespacing. So users, by default, are not namespaced in Docker. So if a container breakout was to occur uh, and, a, and an attacker broke out of a container and onto the host, they'll be the same user they were in the container and on the host. So if the root in the container, they'll be root on the host. And that's kind of game over. So you really want to, to set a user in your Docker files. Um, the, yeah, so to set a user, you need to first create the user, which is simple, um, straightforward Linux commands. Um, and then you can use the user statement in your Docker file to change to that user. Uh, and that will take, um, that will be effective from that point on in the Docker file. Um, so, you, you know, you want to install any software or whatever before you set the user. Um, and it will also take effect when the container starts up. Um, if you're lazy, you can use the nobody user, which is defined uh, in pretty much all Linux distributions, and it's defined to be an unprivileged user. But it's probably better to um, explicitly set the user to be like a high numbered UID so that it doesn't map onto anything on the host. Um, yeah, or oh, sometimes, however, uh, you can't set the user because you need to do something that requires root privileges when your container starts up. So the typical example here is Redis. If you look at the Redis official image, uh, when the Redis official image starts up, it starts up as root because it wants to do a ch own on its volume. But after it's in the ch own, it changes to a different user to start the main application, it changes to, to the Redis user to start Redis. Um, and that's pretty simple to do. And the first thing you probably think to do that with is sudo. But sudo actually has a bit of a problem uh, with containers. Uh, and if you run like a command with sudo, um, you actually end up with two processes running, like the sudo and the actual process you want to run, which isn't ideal, especially if you go back to the thing about uh, forward and signals. So rather than use sudo, what you can do is you can use a tool called gosu by Tianan. Um, and then we see um, when you run Gosu, we do end up with just the one process run. And if you go to um, the GitHub page of Gosu, he, ad he actually explains a few other ways you can do this. So I'm going to got a couple more tips or sort of more random things. Um, Docker and Docker. So who runs Docker and Docker? 
Yeah, people always want to do it. Um, it's generally for CI, CD, I guess. I think that's the number one use case for running Docker inside Docker. Um, the thing is, it's normally a bad idea to run a Docker engine inside another Docker engine. Um, the main problem is you're running a copy and write file system inside a copy and write file system. Um, and that can, doesn't always end well. Um, there's also you know, issues with caching and image stores. So if you run a, a completely blank Docker engine inside there, you're not going to have access to the images on the host, et cetera. So it'll have to pull everything from scratch, and it won't have uh, the build cache, et cetera. Uh, and Jerome Petazzoni, who I'm sure most of us have heard of, um, one of the first engineers at Docker, uh, wrote a really nice blog post called Do Not Use D&D for CI. Um, what you want to do instead most of the time is to mount the Docker socket from the host. So if I do a dash v var run docker sock uh, slash var run docker sock on a, you know, on a Docker engine, a Linux Docker engine, uh, I can then send commands to the Docker engine on the host. So in this case, if I run docker ps in this container, um, I see the container, the container sees itself, if you like. Um, do be aware there are, there are um, pretty serious uh, security implications from running Docker in Docker. Um, well, for running, mounting the Docker socket. But there's probably also fairly serious ones from running Docker in Docker as well. So do be careful if you do this. However, if you really do want to run Docker in Docker, there's actually a special Docker D&D &D image. So if you want to do it, use that image. Uh, and all you have to do is run pass dash dash privileged um, to give it more privileges and capabilities. Uh, and use the Docker D&D &D image, uh, and then, you can, then you'll have a Docker engine running inside a Docker engine, um, and you can do things like, in this case, I started an Nginx container, um, and running Docker PS uh, just shows that Nginx container. It doesn't show the, the Docker instance as well. So we really do have Docker and Docker there. Um, GUI apps, so if you're on a, a Linux laptop like me, um, actually, that's an interesting question. How many of you have a Linux laptop? Oh, whoa. that's quite a good show. I'm impressed. Um, so if you have like a Linux laptop or desktop, um, you can run GUI apps in containers, which can actually be pretty handy, because it gives you a nice way to sort of try out software, and you can like delete it, and you know it's all gone, and it's not left any config files, or lots of dependencies from apt, et cetera, all over the place. Um, and all you really need to do is mount the, the X socket. Um, Jesse Frazel, who again, one of the used to be an engineer at Docker, now at Microsoft, and a very famous blogger. Um, she wrote a really good post on this, and she has a GitHub repo with lots of um, uh, sort of Docker snippets for running various software in uh, containers, including Spotify and stuff. Um, so I, I was actually using uh, the Spotify image just because I had an image, I had a problem with a, a dependency conflict on my laptop, so I actually run Spotify in a container, and it totally works. Yeah, so in this talk, um, what I'm trying to say is by paying attention to our tools and knowing how they work and how to get the best out of them, um, it not only makes us more efficient and effective, but it also taking the time to do this um, conveys a sense of pride in our work. Uh, and I totally believe if you take the time to really understand how things work uh, and work with them, you're going to be happier as well as being more productive. Um, yeah, so that was all the tips. Um, thank you very much for listening. Uh, please do go and I'll send out a link with the, to the slide so you can go and grab all the references and, uh, and, and have a look at all the, the blogs, etc. Um, yeah, but thank you very much. Uh, that, was, that was fantastic. We've got uh, five minutes for questions, so if you want to ask any questions, uh, make your way up to the microphone that's there, uh, and then we can, we can feel any of that stuff. But Adrian's around, so if you don't have time, then we can, we can do it afterwards. Thank you very much. That's cool. Uh, where are you going to send the link out? Uh, um, I'll tweet it. So if you go to... I'll tweet it. So my uh, Twitter's there, at Adrian, though. But I guess Docker will send out... A... Yeah, well, uh, you'll probably, yeah, I think you'll get an email with all the slides. Hello. Yeah. Uh, you spoke about using Prune to get rid of, uh, to free up space on your drive system. At what stage is the cache 
to 64. When does the cache get removed? So that, again, at what stage is the? Uh, the Docker cache removed. The build cache? Yeah. I don't know. That's a good question, actually. Uh, so as, as far as I know, the, if you do an image prune, yeah. uh, it will remove any layers that aren't used, that aren't used by any referenced images. So if you have uh, yeah, images, yeah. but any cache layers that are used by images get retained. But the build cache for a multi-stage build, those layers get removed too. So if you're doing builds all the time, then you're going to build up all this cache and you'll need to do a prune. That prune will get rid of that. The next build you do will be slower. Cool. That's interesting. Thank you, Elton. <laughs> No, you're good. Is that us? So, so there's a question about um, mounting a single file. Um, it's only a problem if you need to edit the file. Yeah, if you restarted the container and uh, you know tried the dash v, that'll pick up a new version. Yeah. Yeah. Um, is this fine? No. Sorry, that again. I have some demons that's running. Yeah, on Kubernetes. Okay. So the question was, they have a, a Kubernetes daemon set that wants to talk to the Docker socket. Well, uh, to be honest, I think the actual answer is to use the Kubernetes API to get that information, not to talk to Docker. Um, but I don't think you'd have to be root to talk to the Docker socket. You need to be a Docker, oh, you need to be a Docker user, don't you? Yeah. So you need to effectively be root, yeah. You want to be using the API because that's actually a huge security hole as well. This is this is not good. <laughs> yeah. So it's about the question was regarding like scratch image and static binaries. So if you, you if you create like a binary in Go or C or something, you can create static binaries. It does take some work. So you've got to make sure that you, the compiler compiles like everything into that binary. Um, so normally when you compile a binary, you won't have something like glibc in the binary because that's available on all Linux distributions. So it's pointless putting it into the, to the binary because it just makes it larger. Um, so if you have a scratch image that won't have glibc, so you either have to manage to get Go or whatever to create a completely static binary with all the glibc in it, or the other thing you can do, and I have done this, if you run like LDD against the binary, it'll tell you what its dependencies are, and you can just copy all those files into the scratch image, and that'll work as well. Oh, that was in the, the Rust command? Yeah, so Rust, um, you, you define, you can like cross compile in Rust. So I can like, uh, on my x86 computer, I can compile for ARM or something, for example. So that's what the that target's about. Yeah, I mean, if I compile for a different target, obviously the, the, whoever runs that container will need to be running the same architecture as the binary. But that's, yeah, that was. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Okay, thank you very much, Adrian. Oh, uh, so it's uh, lunchtime now. Yeah, Feel free to go and get lunch. Oh, come on, man. Let, let people are going. Go on, yeah. last one then. Uh, oh, really? <laughs> you want to ask a question? Uh, yeah, so you mentioned that uh, DEND um, is generally not recommended. Um, and considering that it's a pretty prevalent, its use case is uh, pretty prevalent, that people mostly use it for CI, CD. Um, I know we actually have a tool, shout out real quick to Doc on GitHub. Um, it's a DND solution. Um, is there a more like, appropriate um, or suggested uh, technique ber um, over DEND for CI CD? Um, oh, well, I, I mean, mounting the Docker socket's okay. Um, again, you just need to be aware of the security problems. Uh, but you can do DND. If, it's just, 
you're going to run into problems, and it's you know it's going to be slow, perhaps. As long as you're kind of aware of that, I think it's okay. Um, I don't really know if there's a better solution. Um, uh, no, Lots of people uh, do it. Either the socket, or if you don't want to use the socket, thinking about that previous question, you can um, uh, talk to the Docker API with TCP IP. So you don't yeah. have to use the socket and be root. So yeah, you there, have to. There are other. There are, there, there are always concerns with, with any approach with this. I think. Yeah, there are like special CI/CD things like drone, for example. That's all based on containers, and but that still talks to Docker socket, I believe. Okay, appreciate it. Thanks. Okay. And actually, you can always change the owner of the Docker socket. Yeah. Cool. So the problem is, is you have to like map the UID. You know, you have to make sure you have the same UID as in in your containers and on the host. And yes. then if you move to a different host, that would change. And yeah, it's difficult. But you can. Hey, so I attended Abby Fuller's talk yesterday, and she was mentioning that uh, cache misses lead to larger image sizes. Could you talk a little bit more about that? Cache misses lead to larger image sizes? Uh, no, <laughs> I don't think so. So, I mean, I, I'll check with Abby because I, I didn't see her talk yesterday. I've seen a previous iteration of it. Ca cache misses just mean longer build time, effectively, because it's not being cached. But you shouldn't, unless like Abby's discovered something that I don't know about, I don't, the, the, the end image should be the same. That's the whole point of this stuff, right? Your Docker file will build the same output, whether it's the first time or the hundredth time. It's just structuring your commands are going to make it use the cache more effectively and, and, um, and be faster. So yeah, I, I would be surprised. I, uh, I haven't seen Abby this, this conference. I need to find her, but I'll ask her about that, because uh, she can't be spreading misinformation like that. <laughs> OK, that really is it. So yeah. go and have lunch, Please, and then you, come You can back come here. up and like, talk to me on the stage if you want to know anything more. Uh, come back here afterwards for Scott's talk. Thank you. Thank you, Richard.